this begins EE465, pre tape for Tuesday, August 30th, 2007. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome back to uh, EE465. This is the second lecture of the class, and uh, it's also pre-taped, and I apologize again for that. Uh, the good news is that there will be no more pre-taped classes. Next week, I'm going to be here, and uh, they're going to be live. Okay, so um, we talked about all the logistics last time. Um, I have been checking periodically emails, as you might have uh, guessed already. So basically, if you have any questions and uh, the TA cannot answer them and you need to ask me, please do send me an email. Since I'm away, that's the best way to communicate with me. Uh, so again, my email is kpsounis at usc.edu. And because I'm receiving a lot of emails, try to append uh, at the topic uh, uh, of the email, something that is reminiscent of the class. For example, E465 is a good idea, or something like that, and then write whatever you want to write. Okay, so let's start directly uh, with uh, what we have to do here. So I'm going, uh, last time we talked about uh, sample space, some simple set theory, and uh, uh, probabilities. And now I'm going to define the notion of uh, conditional, let me sit a little bit better and write a little bit better, conditional probability, which is section 1.4 from the book. Um, could you please turn the camera a bit so that the guys can read easier okay great okay so um, conditional probability has to do with uh, the following we are trying to figure out what is the probability that something is gonna occur given that something else has already occurred that's the condition so let me write down this thing what is what I just said what is the probability that any event a occurs given that some other event B has already occurred and we denote this by probability A given B okay so let me give you an example to see the difference say uh, we toss two dice and the outcome of the first is four okay now the question is what is the probability uh, that the sum is six given that the first is four. Okay. First, let's just try to address this using common sense because it's a pretty simple uh, example. If uh, we want the sum to be six, and if we know that the first die turned out to be four, the only way to get a sum of six is if the other die turned out to be two, right? And uh, this is a fair die. And hence the probability is 1 over 6. Okay. So let me write this down for those of you that they are starting to remember in their undergrowth probability. Uh, I'm going to get a lot faster later on. So again, if uh, the first is 4, for the sum to be 6, the second must be 2. Okay. Hence, 
the probability equals 1 over 6 because of course we have a fair die we are not cheating okay now let's compute the probability the sum is 6 without any conditioning without any condition just to see the difference okay um, so the best way to address this perhaps it's easy for some of you to address it but the best way to answer such question is to just list all the possible outcomes so what are the, all the possible outcomes in this case you have two dice you are toasting them so the sample space omega equals you can get one one 1, 2. So this is basically the outcome of the first die. This is the outcome of the second die, and so on. 1, 3, all the way to 1, 6. Or you might get 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, all the way. 3, 1, and so on and so forth. You can get 6, 1, you can get 6, 6. Right? So this is basically your sample space. Okay. There are 36 events in this sample space. And each event occurs with probability 1 over 36. Again, as I said, we have two fair dice. We get a sum of 6 in the following cases 1, 5, 2, 4, 3, 3, 4, 2, 5, 1. There are 5 of them, hence the probability equals 5 over 36 which is clearly different than 1 over 6, which is what we found before. Okay. Oops, I'm sorry about that. In other words, of course, the probability that you get a sum of 6 is different from the probability that you get a sum of 6 conditioning on the event that the first die turned out being 4. Okay. There is clearly a difference whether we condition or we don't condition. Now, okay, this was easy it was easy to compute this particular probability that is a probability of getting a sum of six conditioning on the outcome of the first die because this was a very simple experiment a very simple example but generically i mean in a more general sense it's it's not that easy you cannot just you know use common sense and be done so there is a formula to do the job so to compute the probability of a condition b in general We can use the following formula, which is, by the way, the rigorous definition of conditional probability. Okay? that's the definition so to compute the probability of event A conditioning on event B you use the formula PAB over PB and it is defined only for P of B positive ok that's the formula again recall that this is A intersection B, and we are dropping the intersection signal. Um, the book has an intuitive uh, explanation of this formula, but it's a little bit um, hard to get, uh, so I'll skip it. Uh, you don't really need it now. Basically, I said I'm going to skip it, and now I'm going to talk one minute about it. The idea is that you are really rescaling the probabilities in a new sample space because you are restricting yourself not into the whole sample space, 
but only into this part of the sample space where B has actually occurred, because you know that B has occurred. Uh, I know this is not very clear, and even if you read the book, it's not going to become very clear yet. Uh, and that's why I don't want you to get hung up with that. So for, for, for now, you can still get intuitively what this thing is all about, right? You are trying to find the probability of something, given that you know something else already that is related to that. Okay. Um, examples? Well, check the book. for many examples, simple examples, on how to use this formula. And I will be saying this often, uh, check the book, I will be actually giving you, whenever there is a really good example, I will be explicitly giving you the number of the example. Uh, examples that I'm referring to now, they are pretty trivial, so there's no point of me to give you specific numbers. Just, just read all of them, it's going to take you like half a, half a minute each. Uh, just to see how you use this definition. Um, and I'm going to give you also one more example, which is what we did before, just to make sure that we are on the right track. So before we wanted to compute, um, let's say, continuation of previous example, we wanted to compute the probability that the sum is 6, conditioning on the fact that the first die equals 4, right? So let's use the formula now and see what we are going to get. This would be the probability that the sum is 6 and the first die is 4 over the probability that the first die is 4. Okay. Now if we look at the sample space, <laughs> here is a sample space. There is only one event out of the 36 events in which the sum is 6 and the first die is 4 is the event 4, 2. And I guess 3, 4, 5, it would be here. So it's only this event. And its probability is 1 over 36. And what is the probability that the first die equals 4? It's a fair die. It can get any of 6 values, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. What's the probability that it takes a value 4? 1 over 6. So the total probability is 1 over 6, which is precisely what we found with common sense before. And just to make sure, here it is. This is what we found, just using common sense. Okay. Let me write this down, which is, of course, the same with what? we found before using common sense. But as I said, examples might be far more complicated than this one, and common sense is not going to be of a lot of use, unless you have huge intuition. <laughs> uh, so the formula is going to be very handy in these cases. OK. Let's move on. I'm going to jump from 1, 4 to 1, 6. Uh, section from the book and then get back to 1.5. Uh, so 1.6 is about Bayes' formula, which is very related to conditional probability, and this is why I will introduce this first. So we know uh, probability A condition B equals probability AB over PB. So if you look at this formula, I can interchange A and B, right? And just write it the other way around. So similarly, the probability of B given A should be probability of B A by probability of A. Correct? Now, I'm going to do some... Uh, simple uh, calculations here and I'm gonna write down I wanna use the same paper so I'm gonna write down here probability of A given B equals probability of AB what is probability of AB? probability of AB is clearly equal to probability of BA right? which is P B condition A times PA right? so 
probability AB equals probability BA equals probability B condition A times BA. I'm really, really slow <laughs> uh, because it's the beginning. If you're getting bored, don't worry. You will soon stop being bored. Uh, okay, so PAB equals uh, PAB, which is this PBA times PA divided by PB. Okay, now we call this guy um, a posteriori and this guy a priori probability. This is Latin, and it basically a priori means what you know of A initially, a posteriori is what you know after the fact that you know that B has occurred. So, this is a priori, this is a posteriori, and the base rule is connecting this to that. That's the base rule. Okay. Now, let's see an example uh, of using the base rule. That uses the base rule. Example. <laughs> this example is called binary communication channel example. Uh, those of you that they are taking 465 because I will be talking about this also uh, in Tuesday that I'm going to be back. Uh, those of you that are taking 465 because you want to take com classes but um, you don't want to take 464 because it's, uh, I guess, well, I shouldn't be saying this, too easy. Well, it only covers probability. It doesn't cover Markov chains and queuing, and you already know some stuff about probability, and you want to learn about Markov chains and queuing. Uh, yeah, these type of examples are more related to you guys. Uh, um, those of you that you are networks guys, and you're taking this class because it's required, it's still interesting to see how this... Uh, communication type of examples uh, uh, work out. You know, these guys are sending bits between channels, and uh, uh, they see how probabilities that the bits are going to be transferred from the left to the right uh, correctly, and so on. So let's go with uh, let's go ahead with example, and you'll see what I'm talking about. So this is a binary communication channel. Well, I'm only sending a zero or a one, and I'm saying that with probability. Uh, 0 0.9, if I send a 0, I'm going to receive a 0. Actually, when I send a 1, it's even harder to have an error. With probability 0 0.975, if I send a 1, I will receive a 1. And then there is a possibility of errors. So, if I send a 0, I might actually, at the receiver, think that this was an 1. You know, because of uh, noise and so on on the environment. And this occurs, of course, with probability 0.1, because these things have to add up to 1. And there is also a possibility that I'm going to send a 1, but the receiver is going to get a 0. And the probability of that is 0 0.025. Okay. So again, this is the sender. This is the receiver. And this is the type of bits that they are receiving. Plus, I'm going to give you the probability that I'm sending a 0 versus the probability that I'm sending a 1. Okay. So, again, let me repeat what this is, what the story is about. There is a sender. Sending either 0 and the probability of sending a 0 is 0.2. Or 1, and the probability is 08, to a receiver. Due to noise, the receiver may or may not receive the bit correctly. Okay. And this... Uh, uh, sketch here is showing you the corresponding probabilities. Okay, so example the probability that I sent 0 and the receiver uh, gets 0 equals 0.9. Okay, and so on and so forth.
that's good. Okay. Hopefully you are, uh, you, are you understood the the, uh, the problem statement. Since you are not here to give me feedback and tell me, please uh, explain again. Um, if not, do ask the TA. The TA is here. I'm sorry, he, I told him to be here, <laughs> to be uh, in class, so you can ask him. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm, I'm moving on. Now, what is the question? Given that a zero is received, we want to find the probability that a zero was sent. You can see why this is an interesting uh, question to ask, right? That's all, that's all we care. We are sitting at the receiver and we are receiving bits, but we are really interested in what was sent, not in what we are receiving. We want to figure out what the sender wanted to send to us. Hopefully we got the right thing, but maybe we didn't. Okay. What is the sample space? Always start with the sample space when you have to answer questions like that. Our sample space is the following. I'm going to use the following notation for an event. This is what is sent and this is what is received. This is how I'm going to denote an event. So basically, zero, 00 means a 0 is sent and a zero is received. What other options we have? I send a zero and I'm getting a one. I'm sending a an one and I'm getting a zero. Or I'm sending a an one and I'm getting a an one. This is the sample space. It has one, two, three, four possible events. Okay. Now I'm gonna define uh, um, more complicated events to help me answer the question. So we'll define uh, event A as the following. The event 0 is sent. And I'm going to define event B as follows. 0 is received. Why am I defining these two events? Uh, because look at what I'm trying to find. Given that the 0 is received, find the probability that the 0 was sent. So I want to find the probability that a zero was sent A given B. A zero is received. Okay. This part here is important because it is not given to you. In a sense, the problem that is given to you is that here is my channel with some errors and this is my question. I want to know what is the probability that a zero was sent if a zero is received. This part is modeling. You decide the sample space. The sample space is not an objective thing out there. Depending on the answers that you need, depending on the questions that you need to answer, you say, oh, okay, this is the sample space that makes sense to define here, and that's the sample space that makes sense to define. What is sent and what is received? You also define the events. Since this is what we need to uh, answer, these two events are helpful because now I can, can use this notation and start doing uh, formulas. Okay. By the way, uh, what is the event zero is sent expressed in basic events that is using one of these four basic events? Zero is sent, zero is sent, zero is sent. So this is zero, zero or zero, one. And what is the event zero is received? A zero is received here and a zero is received here. So this is zero, zero and one, zero. Okay. So now I need to find this. Well, this is an example right after I introduced to you the base rule. So clearly, I'm going to use the base rule. <laughs> the base rule says the probability of some event A given some event B equals the probability of some event B given some event A divided by PB times PA. Okay. And I will also use uh, the law of total probability to compute PB because PB 
is the probability that the zero is received. We have no idea what's the probability that the zero is received. We need to break it down into smaller pieces. So we will say, well, you want to know what is the probability that the zero is received. Okay. This is the probability that a zero is received if a zero was sent given times the probability that the zero was sent or the probability that the zero is received if not a zero but a one was sent a c times the probability that a one was sent okay let me repeat this again this is really the law of total probability because I'm really doing P B A plus P B A complement. Recall that the law of total probability says if you need to compute the probability of an event B, you have to sum up the probabilities of the intersection of B with the number of events that they are partitioning the total sample space. Clearly, A and A complement partition the total sample space because A and A complement make the whole sample space. Also, remember what A complement is. A complement is everything else except from A. Okay. So, this is what I'm doing here. And this is base rule. Okay. Clear? And recall that this is the complement. Okay. If we put everything together, we get probability of A given B equals P B given A P B given A B A plus P B given A C P A C times P A. Okay. Good. By the way, there is one more thing that I want to make sure you understand. There are a lot of things happening here. So the law of total probability is telling you that P B equals that. How do I go from here to here? Okay. I'm, I'm waiting so that some of you are going to think about it. So the way I'm going from here to here is by using conditional probability. So perhaps I should have written it like that. Let, let me write it like that, such that it's super clear to everybody. I kind of bypassed a step here, but it's better if I make it, you know, a little bit more, if I go a little bit slower now that it's the beginning. So, I am going from here to here using the law of total probability. And this equals that using the definition of conditional probability. Why? Because, as you remember, PB condition A equals PBA by PA. So if you solve for PBA, you get PB condition A times PA, which is what I have here. And PB condition AC equals PBAC divided by PAC. And the same story comes there. Okay. Super clear now? I'm sure. Let's uh, put some numbers. Why do I, did I have to use the base rule in the first place? Now you will understand why. I wanted to figure out PA condition B. What is the probability that if I send a zero, what is the probability, excuse me, that if I have received a zero, I have actually sent a zero. But what we know in real life and in this particular example, it's the other way around. We know that if we send a zero with probability 9%, 90%, we are going to receive a zero. And with probability 10%, we are going to receive an one. We don't know the other way around. The other way around is what we want to know. Okay. Again, we want to compute what is the probability that we are that we have sent a zero given that we are receiving a zero. 
But what we know is the probability that we are receiving a zero given that we have sent a zero. And in order to flip these things around, we have used the base rule and the log star probability. So uh, we wanted to find probability A condition B, and now we have expressed this as a function of probability B condition A, or B condition A complement. Okay, we flip them around. And now we look at our nice picture, and we substitute with numbers. PBA. If I send a zero, am I going to receive a zero? Yes. Probability, 0 0.9. PBA, 0 0.9. PA, what is the probability that I'm sending a zero? 0 0.2. It's given here. 20% of the times I'm sending zeros, 80% of the times I'm sending ones. P, B, condition A, complement. This means probability that if I send a complement, that is, if I send not a zero, that is, if I send a 1, what is the probability I'm going to get a 0? If I send a 1, what's the probability that I'm going to get a 0? 0? 0 0.025 times PA complement. Probability that I am not sending a 0. Probability that I'm sending a 1. 80%. Times PA, which is 0.2. Okay? If you do the math, this turns out to be 0.9. Okay. And, okay, this symbol basically says end of example. A lot of books use this symbol to denote the end of some proofs and so on and so forth. End of proofs, end of examples, etc. Okay. Um, now, in general, if we have a number of events, I'm going to give you uh, um, something more general than the base rule that is called base formula. If C1, C2, and so on and so forth, Cn partition omega, then we can write PA condition B equals PB condition A times PA. But instead of just having PB here, which is base rule, I'm going to use the law of total probability as I have done here to end up with this formula. And I'm going to generalize this. And I'm going to write here summation from I equals 1 to N, PCI, PB condition CI. And you can see that this is a special case of that, where my CIs are A and A complement. Okay. And this is known... Uh, as the base formula. Okay. Oops. That's it. Great. Let's uh, move on. Normally, I, I would have asked for questions here. Uh, maybe I should pause for a minute so that you can ask questions to weigh the TA, but it's okay. Again, I apologize for this pre-taping thing. Uh, you do want your faculty to be active, right, in their research and be <laughs> known guys rather than just teaching. And, you know, the negative aspect says that sometimes they have to travel. So, Independence. Section 1.5. This is uh, the last thing uh, that I'm going to cover from Chapter 1. This is basically the end of Chapter 1. Independence is a very important uh, uh, idea in uh, probability. And uh, the intuition behind it is exactly what you are guessing by just looking at the word independence. So the idea is that when we have a number of events that they are independent, they don't really affect each other, right? So if they don't affect each other, 
if one of these events has already occurred and we know that, this doesn't give us any information about the other event because they are independent. So let me write this down. Two events, A, B, are independent if and only if the probability of their intersection is the probability of the one times the probability of the other. Okay. And since by the definition of conditional probability this equals that if we substitute this here we get PA PB by PB which means that probability A condition B equals PA so this is the definition but this is also something interesting it is derived directly from the definition uh, of independence and the definition of conditional uh, probability <laughs> what does it say intuitively it says what A and B are independent we know that hence so let me say this is intuition A and B are independent hence knowing that B has occurred does not give us any info about A and hence the probability that A is going to occur in the future given that B has already occurred is the same, is the same thing with the probability that A is going to occur in the future ok uh, recently there has been a lot of <laughs> that's an interesting example a lot of talk about the stock market right it's going up down these days and they say that well what has happened so far is independent of the future that is if you look at what was happening over the last weeks it's not going to help you at all in predicting what's going to happen in the future they are independent events okay so in general we say that intuitively two events are independent where knowing one event Ah, uh, the stock market, let's say, has been falling. Well, by the time you're going <laughs> to listen to this lecture, you never know, because I'm pre-taping it in advance, maybe it will start going up again. Anyway, the fact that it has been falling is not giving me any information about what is going to happen, you know, next, on the event of what's going to happen tomorrow. These are independent events. Okay? So, let's see a lot of examples. Assume, example number one, that the binary channel in the previous example is used to send two bits independently. This is important. I'm using one bit, then independently I'm using another bit. Oh, well, I'm sending another bit. What is the probability? You might have already guessed that I'm lazy and sometimes I'm not writing probability, but I'm just writing prob full stop. Okay, this is probability. Okay. We have been, I will be writing probability quite a lot of times in this course, so it makes sense to have acronyms like that. So what is the probability, abbreviations, whatever, that both bits are in error? Let's start by defining the right events. So let's define the events. E1 the event is the following. The first bit is in error. And E2 is the event. The second bit is in error. 
What we want to find is the probability that both bits are in error. That is, both E1 and E2 have occurred. In other words, we want to find the intersection of E1 and E2. Okay. But since these two guys are independent, by the definition of independence, it is simply P E1 times P E2. Okay. And last, by symmetry, this is just P square E1. And I'm going to call this probability of error. This is what we need to find. It's pretty obvious what I mean by symmetry, right? I'm using the same channel. I'm sending a bit, something happens, then I'm using exactly the same channel and I'm sending another bit, independently. So there is complete symmetry in these two uh, experiments. This mega experiment is consists of two sub-experiments that they are basically the same experiments. So the statistics governing the first experiment are identical to the statistics governing the second experiment. This is what I mean by symmetry. And hence, P1 equals P2. Okay, and hence this is just P square E1. Okay. Now we need to find P error. To find P error, we need to find P1. So we go. Um, that event A is the event 0 is sent and event B is the event 0 is received. Then, to find the probability of the event E1, note that E1 is what? Is the event I'm sending a zero, and then I am receiving not a zero, but a one, and hence an error occurs. Or I'm sending a one, but I'm not receiving a one, I'm actually receiving a zero. Okay. So, intuition. You can think about this as end, and you can think about that, the union, as or. That's the intuition about why this makes sense. Okay, should I write this down? I'm asking. <laughs> uh, I'm going to write this down. So, uh, zero cent and one received or one sent and zero received this is what this thing is saying sorry okay thus the probability of the event e1 equals probability a b c plus probability a c b now Let's use the definition of conditional probability, yet another abbreviation, uh, P A, P B C condition A plus P uh, A C, P B condition A C. Okay, numbers. Numbers, numbers, numbers. Sorry. Where are my numbers? Here are my numbers. So, PA, point two. PBCA. PBCA means I'm receiving a 1 and a 0 was sent. I'm receiving a 1 and a 0 was sent. Probability, 0 0.1. OK. 
plus PAC, that is I'm sending a 1, times I'm receiving a 0 but a 1 was sent, I'm receiving a 0 but 1 was sent, times 0.25 from here. If you do the math, this is 0 0.04. Okay. Hence, the probability of error, which is the probability that both bits are in error, which is what we were trying to find in the first place, is 0.04 square, which is that small. Small probability of error. That they are both in error. Okay. Now, let's uh, generalize. I have only introduced you the definition of independence in the event that I have uh, two random variables. Uh, sorry, two events. We haven't talked about the random variables. We will talk in a while. What about independence among more than two events? So, in general, the events A1, A2, A3, and so on, all the way to An, are independent if and only if for any subset a i1 a i2 a i k the probability of the intersection of this subset equals the multiplication the product of the individual probabilities now I know that this formula I'm sorry about that so I know that this formula I'm waiting so that you write it down so in general a1, a2, a3, an are independent if and only for any subset of them ai1, ai2, aik the probability of the intersection of these guys is the product of the probabilities now again this formula is looks scarier than it actually is. Let me explain to you the notation. I have n guys here, 1, 2, 3, n, and I want to refer to a subset, subset out of these n guys. How am I gonna do this? I'm doing it using this trick. I'm using two subscripts now, i1, i2, i3, all the way to ik. These k guys can be any of these n guys. Okay, and then I'm saying that the probability of the intersection of these k guys is the product of these guys. So now I have ai j, and in the product I'm varying j from j equals 1 to k. So that's the notation. But let me give you an example for those of you that you don't like weird mathematical notation. You should start liking it later on in the semester. If I have A1, A2, and A3, these are independent. If and only if the probability of A1, A2, A3 equals the probability of A1 times probability A2 times probability A3. But also, remember the definition, for any subset this should hold. Another subset is A1, A2. So this should also hold. Any other subsets? A1, A3. So this should also hold. Any other subsets? A2, A3. Just imagine these guys being 4 or 5. We're going to end up with a lot of subsets to check. But yes, this is the only way to make sure that they are independent. It has to be the case that any subset has this property. Okay, <laughs> example. I'm going to give you an example that is going to show you why we need to satisfy this property for any subset. So I'm going to call this example the need for all subsets to satisfy number two. Number two is this equation over here. Let's roll 
Efer Dais Efer Dai Independently And let's Define the following Events Event A Actually, it makes more sense if I wrote it twice. Hmm? Yeah, it's gonna make it more interesting. Let's roll two fair dice independently and define the following. Event A, the first die equals one, two, or three. Event B, I should do this. The first die equals um, 3, 4, or 5. Okay, that's good. And event C, the sum is 9. Okay. So, question. R, A, B, and C independent. What do you think? I'm gonna pause now for a minute, even though this is pre taped because I want you to think for a minute. Each one of you think. The first die is one, two, or three. This is event A. The first die is three, four, or five. This is event B. Okay, and event C is the sum of the two dice that I'm sewing independently, that I'm throwing independently, is 9. Do you think that A, B, and C are independent or not? Intuitively. Forget about math, forget about formulas. Intuitively. So, let me help you with it. Suppose I had an event saying here, the first die equals 1. Is there any way I'm gonna get a 9 as a sum? No way. The second one can be maximum 6. <laughs> so if the first die turns out to be 1, 2, or 3, the only way that I'm gonna get a 9 is if I actually get a 3 out of 1, 2, or 3, and I get a 6. <laughs> but if the first die is 3, 4, or 5, then there are more options, right? I could get a 6 with 3, I could get a 5, match it with 4, I could get a 4 on the second dice, match it with 5. So there seems to be some dependence, right? Whether I'm going to get a 9 or not, does depend on what the first die, dice outcome is going to be, right? So, intuitively, there is some dependence. For example, if the sum is 9, this provides some info for the outcome of the first die. Example, no way that the first die equals, let's say, 2. Okay. Now, let's see if P A B C equals or is not equal to P A P B P C. They are independent. Well, we think, I'm sorry, we think that they are not independent, right? I mean, intuitively, it looks like they are not independent. They depend on each other. This was uh, the definition of independence. Recall that we need to double check that this is the case for every subset, but at least this is what usually students mistakenly check without checking anything else. If I have three random, uh, if they have three events, I'll just check this. P A B C equals P A times B plus times P C. So let's see if this is equal or not. Since they are probably dependent events, we are expecting this not to be equal to that, right? But let's see. Okay. C 
since the dice are fair and the experiments are independent the possibility of any pair of I'm sorry outcomes example 1 and 2 is 1 over 36 okay you know what I'm talking about because we saw the previous example and it was very similar now what is the probability of A that is what is the probability that the first die is 1 2 or 3 this is a fair die it can be 1 2 3 4 5 6 with equal probability right so it is 3 times 1 over 6 right 1 over 2 okay you want to write it more uh, let me do it this way 1 2 or 3 okay similarly the probability of event B which is the event that the first dies 3 4 or 5 is what 1 over 2 don't make me write again the same thing obvious okay we also need to compute P of C in order to be able to check and P A B C to be able to check whether the formula holds or not what is P of C C says the probability that I have a sum of 9 how did we do it the last time we are going to just count all the different outcomes that they give a sum of 9 this is the probability of 4 5 5 4 3 6 6 3 this means first die equals 4 this is second die equals 5 and so on and so forth are there any other outcomes out of the 36 outcomes that they are going to give us a sum of 6? No, right? These are 1, 2, 3, 4 outcomes. So, it is 4 outcomes times 1 over 36 for each outcome. Okay, which is 1 over 9. Good. Now let's compute P, A, B, C. Why don't you tell me what this thing is? What is PABC? PABC says the first die is either 1 or 2 or 3. The first die is also either 3 or 4 or 5 and the outcome is 9. How are we going to figure this out? Let's use common sense. Okay, if we want both A, so for A and B to hold, the first die has to be equal to 3. Do you see why? A says 1, 2, or 3. B says 3, 4, or 5. The only common option is that the die was 3. Okay, now, given that the first die was 3, for C to hold, the second die has to be what? 6. There is no other way to get a sum of 9 if the first die is 3. Okay, so the probability of the event ABC is the probability of the outcome 3,6. <laughs> this is a single outcome out of all the possible outcomes, correct? So the probability is 1 over 36. Okay. So, let's check. PABC equals 1 over 36. PA times PB times PC equals. PA is 1 over 2. PB is 1 over 2. PC is 1 over 9 which is 1 over 36 
which is equal, interesting enough, to PABC. Even though these guys are not independent. I mean intuitively. We don't know yet actually. But intuitively we said, hmm, doesn't look like these guys are independent. So, are they independent? I mean, we have to trust math, right? We didn't do a mistake. Are they independent? We don't think they are independent, but look at this formula. Well, the answer is, you have not checked yet the other subsets. You have only checked PABC equals PA times PB times PC. You haven't checked PAB is PAB equals PA times PB. We don't know. Let's check it out. So, R a, B, C, independent? I don't think so. So let's find P, A, B. P, A, B equals P, 3. We know that already, right? The first die equals 3. We had a discussion about this one minute ago. What is the probability that the first die equals 3? It's a fair die. 1 over 6. Okay. What is PA times PB? 1 over 2 times 1 over 2. You remember it's 1 over 2, right? Here it is. PA is 1 over 2. PB is 1 over 2. 1 over 4. Guess what? Not equal to 1 over 6. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So... Our intuition was correct. As expected, they are not independent. Our intuition was correct, and the math are obviously correct. But we have to remember to double check for every subset that this is satisfied, which is a lot of work, I have to admit. Okay. So, in the remaining 15 minutes, uh, I will start talking about uh, random variables, which is chapter 2. So before I do that, let me write down here as a summary what we have learned in chapter 1. Sample space and events. Probabilities. On events, conditional probability, base formula, and independence. Okay, I am assuming that for all of you, this was a nice, helpful revision. Okay, in your basic probability class, you must have done definitely all these things. Okay, if you don't remember them very well, make sure this weekend you're going to spend enough time revising them. Okay, because we're going to assume that you know this already for the material of next week. Now, let's go to chapter 2, which is about random variables which also you know from your uh, undergrad probability class. But I'm going to go through it as I went through it, uh, the other stuff. So, section 2.1 introduces random variables. So, there are two interesting questions here that I want to address. One is, what is a random variable? You know, a lot of students learn their undergrad probability and then the random variables, but they don't really realize what exactly a random variable is. You know, it's something complicated. Oh my God, I don't really know what this thing is. It's actually something extremely simple. And the second thing I want to address is, why in the first place are we introducing random variables? I mean, it looks to me that we have a working set of tools here, right? Events, probabilities on events conditional probabilities on events, independence, 
we can work out things out with events. Why do we need random variables? So, <laughs> let me start with uh, answering the first. What is a random variable? So, a random variable x capital X is a real valued function x of little omega over the sample space omega and this little omega is an event an event from this sample space omega so basically if you remember from your real real analysis class that I'm sure all of you have taken in your undergrad this is a function x that goes from the sample space omega to the real numbers r and if you want a picture because I like pictures say this is omega and this is a particular event little omega and this is the real line r and this is a particular real value x of omega this is what a random variable is it's just a mapping it's just a number actually that simple I mean it's not a number it's a function but it's a function that goes from the sample space to the real line so it's numbers okay real numbers and the random variable is the function. Now, a small aside. To please our math friends from the mathematics department, I really should say some things about this function. This has to be a measurable function. But since we don't know measure theory, and there's no way we will cover measure theory in this class, there's no point in going along these lines. Do you do remember from last uh, lecture, this discussion I had with you about the triplet uh, omega sample space P probability measure and F sigma field well if we were to uh, discuss a lot about this stuff we were also going to discuss a lot about this thing about this random variable being a special real value function but for all practical purposes in all your engineering life, unless you decide to do a PhD in uh, probability, that's good enough. Okay, it's just a simple real valued function. We take something from the sample space and we map it into real numbers. That's what it is. Okay. So I have addressed the first question which has to do with what a random variable is and hopefully by now you should feel really cool with that. It's just a function. Real numbers, not a big deal. Notation. Always use uppercase letters for random variables and lowercase letters <laughs> for their values. Okay, in other words, x equal x means the random variable, I'm going to be using this a lot, this means random variable. x takes the value little x. Okay, <laughs> and now it's time to address the second question. Why do we want to define random variables? Okay, it's just a function from the sample space to the real numbers. Why aren't we happy with the sample space and the events? Well, the problem is that it is extremely hard to work with events and sample spaces. I mean, it was a bit complicated, the examples I gave you, and these were like the most trivial possible examples ever. Simple coin tosses, maybe roll a die that was it if you want to model any real things of the real world any communication systems networks wireless networks wireline networks buffers 
cell phone communication, whatever you name it, things are gonna get way more complicated and there is pretty much no way we can do the analysis and we can do the math and we can get results about our system that we are trying to model and study if we stick to sample spaces and events. There is no way we are gonna make it. So the real reason why we are introducing random variables is because we don't want to have to deal with events and sample spaces and set theory and intersections and unions and this stuff. Instead, we want to deal with real numbers because we know how to deal with real numbers, right? We can start doing derivations, integrations. This is a function of real numbers. You know, it's a lot easier to do complicated stuff when we use real numbers rather than events. Okay, so that's the reason. Maybe I should write this, right? Why do we introduce slash use random variables just to make our life easier? Okay, now let me give you a bunch of examples and then we are done. And coin flips. <laughs> the coin is such that we get a head with some probability P. Okay, is this a random variable? Yes. So the random variable X that I'm going to define is the number I should have said, can we define a random variable like that? Is the number of heads. <laughs> okay. So again, I'm having a coin, I'm tossing it n times. It gets head with probability p. Clearly, with 1 minus p, you're going to get a tail. And I am defining a random variable x as the number of heads. Okay. What are the possible values of this random variable? It can be zero. Maybe I'm only getting tails. One, two, three, all the way to n. Maybe I was every single time getting heads. Okay. What is the probability of the event x equals zero? This is an event, right? But now I'm using the random variable to express the event. What's the probability that x equals zero? Come on. You get head with probability p, you get tail with probability 1 minus p. If x equals 0 means that I was extremely un unlucky and I was getting tails every single time. These are n coin flips. Maybe I should say n independent coin flips. Hmm? So what's the probability x equals 0? 1 minus p, that is the first time I got a tail. Times 1 minus p, the second time I got a tail too. Times 1 minus p and so on and so forth, how many times? n times. So it's 1 minus p to the n. Okay, I'm getting a tail every single time. What's the probability that x equals 1? Think about it. I'll tell you next time pretty simple but what's the probability that x equals n I'm getting ahead every single time p times p times p times p p to the n think about this again and do it yourself okay another example let's toss a coin until the first head appears. I'm going to define the random variable x as the number of flips required till I get a head. Okay. I have a coin, 
I'm flipping the coin until I get ahead. How many times would I have to flip this coin till I get ahead? Well, I have to flip it at least once. Maybe I'm not going to get ahead, I'm going to get a tail, so I have to flip it a second time. And so on and so forth. So my random variable x is getting values in the following set. 0, 1, 2, I'm sorry, not 0. You have to flip it at least once. 1, 2, 3, 4. When do I stop? Well, maybe I'm extremely, extremely, extremely unlucky. Maybe I'm tossing a coin that I found through a pirate or something and it always lands tails. It might actually take me a lot of time till I'm going to get ahead for the first time. All the way to infinity. Okay. Now, what's the probability that x equals 1? I'm flipping the coin, I'm getting head the first time. P. Right? What's the probability that x equals 2? Flipping the coin the first time, I'm getting a tail. Probability 1 minus P. I'm flipping it the second time, I'm getting a head. 1 minus P times P, done. What's the probability that x equals N? I flipped the coin for n minus 1 times, and every one of these times, I was getting a tail. And then, at the nth time, I got a head. So this is 1 minus p to the n minus 1 times p. Okay. <laughs> Another example. I'm going to define a random variable that models something from real life now. I'm interested in packet arrivals in time duration 0t in a network, let's say. Okay. So the story is Suppose I am monitoring the number of packets. This is another way of writing packets quickly. Ah, and this is <laughs> number. Okay, the first couple of lectures I will be saying this to you so that you get used to the notation. The number of packets arriving at a router in the internet for t seconds okay now this number depends on the users the protocols the congestion the level of congestion, if the network is congested or if it's not congested, and so on and so forth. And it is a random variable. It's not something fixed. Okay. What is the value that this random variable may take? Ah, uh, maybe there was just no packet through these t seconds. I was monitoring a link at a router that there is no traffic, there are no users sending any type of data through this particular link. Zero. Maybe there was one packet, two packets, three packets, all the way till some large number. This is also a random variable. Okay, I'm not specifying the statistics of this random variable yet, because it's more complicated. We will do this later on in the class, that is, we will introduce uh, Rules that they are telling us what are the statistics of this random variable, the random variable that corresponds to number of packet arrivals in a router for some period of time t. Okay. Notice that all these random variables that I have introduced you so far, they take integer values. But of course, you could have a random variable that also takes continuous values. But 
uh, we will study these two types of random variables separately. The first type of random variables, which is the ones I have introduced to you so far, are called discrete random variables because their values are discrete. One, two, three, four. And the other type are called continuous random variables because their values can be continuous. Like square root of two or, you know, basically they can take, the important thing is that they can take any value in the real life. They are continuous. Remember the distinction between uh, continuous functions. Anyway, I don't want to get into that. It's going to happen. So, next time, I'm going to introduce to you discrete random variables, and I'm going to introduce to you some famous discrete random variables that we will be using again and again into our modeling uh, efforts. Okay? And uh, after that, I will introduce to you continuous random variables. Okay? That they are more complicated than you might imagine. So that's it. Uh, have fun in the weekend. Again, sorry for not being here in the first week of classes. Hopefully you were able to follow uh, the first two lectures. The good thing is that this, um, the topics covered in the first two lectures were really introductory topics. And I hope and I'm sure that most of you already know and remember most of this stuff. Uh, but then guys are doing a good job, so the video should be good, the voice should be clear, but you can always send me emails with questions. You can uh, see, as I said, uh, the lecture again through the internet. Just download the stream uh, in case something wasn't clear. And see you uh, next Tuesday, this time in flesh and blood. Okay, see you guys.